tonight on Terra Firma, a Terra Firma Artist Union Roundtable Special hosted by Drew Carson in collaboration with Saloon 7 Studios. Tonight's panel guests are Jeff Kakmarinski, Todd Brown, Jennifer Sifuentes, Blaine Kerr, Michael Jones, Steve Hainich, Dave Marinska, CJ Ripka. And now, here's your host, Drew Carson. I'm Liz Joplin. How the fuck did you forget about Liz? That's probably why I get kicked out, <sighs> calling them pussies. Anyway, welcome to the show. <laughs> it's oh, not quite live yet. It's going live in about two, one. Oh, it says live on my screen. <laughs> Yeah, it says live on mine too, but it's been live for a while. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I throw the phone over my shoulder. We're done. <laughs> and we're live. Sorry, Drew. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, I regret it's, nothing. Podcast, I mean, <laughs> that one goes right. <laughs> you wanted it to go right, you wouldn't have us on. Let's be oh, real. Oh, shit. If I wanted it to go right, I would have fucking host it myself. <laughs> <laughs> This is my socializing. <laughs> well, thank you for having us as a part of it, man. Yep. Anyway, uh, I'm on screen so people will be able to watch it. Whose who dog is that? That'd be mine. <laughs> oh. Sorry, that's just me. I'm getting excited. <laughs> yeah, my oh, dick okay. always makes that noise. Thank God. <laughs> God damn it. Still trying to find out how to get rich off it. <sighs> It'll happen. <laughs> on, on this show, it'll happen. Yeah. So, what the fuck was the topic again? Then I... <laughs> is originality in Hollywood horror dead? There we go. Who wants to jump in first? Uh, skip me. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> there, that's the opinion. I think it's been dead for about a decade. Wait, hold on, hold on. Uh. <laughs> a decade? Full, a full decade. Yeah, about that long. I mean, there's the odd title here and there that sometimes is surprising when you catch it on cable, right? I mean, I can't, I know, I know, I don't know. I don't know if I would say fully dead. I feel like there's been a lot of cool things that have happened in some rebootish territories, but um, I don't know if it's completely dead. I think you have to go outside the country to find anything. Any uh, in, Most of the stuff that I watch anymore, I'm watching with subtitles. I mean, Train to Basan, things like that. There's just not, for me anyway, a, a lot of American horror that doesn't uh, involve some, you know, maniac hacking up people into little teeny bits in creative ways and, and calling it, you know, Saw 8, 9, 10 or whatever. Um, I, just, I will say that, that's, not <laughs> for me. that's not for me that's not horror no mm -mm. well oh, yeah. I, think the, I think the important distinction is though is we're talking about Hollywood horror yeah. stuff that comes out of the big studios yes right. when it comes to big budget Hollywood horror yes it's dead now the American independent circuit has good stuff but if you're talking about strictly Hollywood yes there is no originality left. It's, it's if, like, can we remake for a big box office budget and make as much money as possible? And, you know, oh, screw it if it's not original. You know, people still pay to see it, you know, whatever. Um, it's, it's a big money grab. And what I find most disturbing uh, with a lot of Hollywood projects, not just in the horror genre, is you got a bunch of uncreative people <laughs> sitting around, and they're the ones in charge of what gets financed, what gets a budget, what gets produced, and they kind of push it over the, the wall to creative people and say, okay, you're going to remake Freddy versus Jason, and go! So, um, yeah, I, I definitely... Uh, Bloomhouse, I'm a big fan of Bloomhouse, but even they seem oh. to be getting a little hey, you say anything bad about Blumhouse I am coming through this fucking video camp I, I, the, I, they, they're predictable because they they have um they've got they do some really good stuff insidious yeah, I love it. The fucking shut yeah, yeah. Insidious, I think is the thing that stands out to me as at least 
the way that they tell their story, the way that they're now designing stories to be. The other thing is, is that they're designing them to be spread out over several films. Like I'll, I'll go with you and say that Saw clearly isn't horror because after the like first one, there's really nothing scary. Yeah. There's nothing shocking about it. But having watched all of those <coughs> movies, binging them recently for one of our Thrones games episodes, I suddenly had a little bit more of a respect for it just because I was like, it had me pulled in. I was like, all right, I want to see how this guy who's double crossing that guy who now this scene from two movies ago is more relevant in this fifth movie than it was in the third movie. And I was like, usually that's the shit we used to complain about. And here I found myself sitting there going, this is kind of cool. But at the same time, I was also watching Mindhunter. You know what I mean? So I was kind of had my foot in a much newer sort of the streaming world yeah. presentation of a psychological I would say that verges on a still here the same way that like Silence of the Lambs did. You know, it's definitely in the scarier realm of things you could watch. If you're if you're if you're binging it though, I mean, if you hang around Jim Jones long enough, he starts to make sense too. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, man. What if somebody read all of your books in like a couple weeks and they were like, "Oh shit, man, I can't do any more zombie stuff." You know what I mean? It's like it, I think anything can suffer from oversaturation. Yeah, um, that's that's just it, and that's that's why you know people are like, I, as soon as your book comes out, people are like, "When's the next one, dude?" I just put one out. I mean, it takes a little while. Read somebody, <laughs> else for, you know, for a few Not weeks. Everybody, Stephen King. Yeah, you know, I mean, I can I can put one out every four months if that's <laughs> all I do, but that's not all I do anymore with the production studio going. So um, they're now down to about every six. But, yeah, I, I mean, and I've been hearing zombies are over for probably a good three years, but... Um, they keep they renewing The Walking yeah. Dead, man. They just yeah. keep renewing Clearly it. The walking, AMC and The Walking Dead didn't get that memo. <laughs> yeah, the, the marketing of, of that genre is no more over than... Uh, like my English teacher told me in the creative writing class that got me started to doing this again. Um, vampires have been around forever, but you know, the stories keep coming. I think what happened was Kirkman established the zombie genre so that it's now like the vampire. It's, it's not going anywhere. It's not going to go anywhere. It'll, it'll there's wane. Like a, a, there's always, I guess, an audience where people want more of that. Yes. They, so, they like, that vampires that. and zombies are one of those things now. Yeah. Yeah, Kirkman, I think, finished what Romero wanted or, or, or didn't want to do. But I think Kirkman finished the job. He made them a mainstream item. And that's what they are now. They are a mainstream item. Whereas before, if you talked about it, you were on the fringe, you know. But you know, going back to the whole horror thing, I mean, what's the last true horror movie that didn't involve uh, an offset serial killer that you watched that really had you on the edge of your seat? Hmm. I mean, for me, it was Insidious. Like, I will always immediately just go to Insidious. I was going to say, I always bring up, whenever I'm on Drew's show, I always bring up James Wan and everything in the Conjuring universe. Oh, the me, I, I love all that shit, and it scares me every yeah. time. It's good well, quality, good production value. Yeah, and, and James Wan knows how to tell a good story, too. Um, I feel it's like... the first Saw movie, by the way. I mean, he was also... Yeah, with, with, yeah before, and... Before um, go ahead. <laughs> I think for me, and I mean, I'm sure the majority of you are going to disagree with. I feel like Sinister, um, because it does have a super, you know, supernatural element. And yes, like, Bagul, the entity, is killing people, but he's not the killer, it's the kids. So it's a pattern, but it's not so much serial killer. That, and in the first movie, not so much in the second movie, the kills were super creative, and they were so fucking creepy and scary. Yeah. Like, Every single kill was like, I don't want to go that way. <laughs> yeah. I don't no, the first one like I thought was great. The second one I thought was a huge disappointment. It Hence, was. where there's no more. <laughs> I know, I know, and it pissed me off because I was writing what I thought Sinister Two should have been, and then I quit after they were like, "Oh, we're filming it," and I was like, "Okay, whatever," and then saw it and was so disappointed because. <laughs> There were so many different directions you could have taken that storyline yeah. and that whole mythology. And putting and you... Bagul in his easy top tuxedo was not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. See, I it's haven't like... seen it, and now I'm like, fuck this, I'm never watching it. <laughs> <I know. laughs> so he shows up like, yeah, my first movie was King Shit, what's up? I'm back. <laughs> I, and it's, I was it's like, really oh, God. You know, well, the, I mean, the whole I... mythology is really interesting, but they took the easy way out with, like, the kids, and it's like, 
We've done the kids. It's so fucking boring. We've done Damien. We've done Children of the Corn. We've done, you know, we've done everything we possibly can with children. Enough. I'm tired of seeing creepy kids. Let's do something else with our time. Please. Oh, no. This oh, shit on creepy kids? I don't know. <laughs> Well, I have to retitle my new book. Oh, shit. <laughs> I think we did a horror cast about creepy kids and how we're so good. Uh, I don't know. I think Hills Have Eyes still have Well, see, for me. For- Hills Have Eyes, yeah, because that shit could be real someday. And, you know, that day could be closer than we think these days. I don't know. I mean, the idea of mutants from a fucking nuclear fallout, that's some scary shit. Yeah. Um, I well, think For me, I-, I was happy to see your return to something like the Green Inferno. Yeah. Oh, the cannibal, yeah. movie, the cannibal movie hasn't been done really well in a long time, and that was a great throwback to films like that's Cannibal good. Fair, Cannibal that's Holocaust. True. That's true. That was but, a really good one. Part of, the reason why that movie, part of the reason why that movie worked so well is because it was extreme adult horror. It was not PG-13 rated right. kitty fair. Right. It was hard. Part of the reason that was dying. <laughs> the most. <laughs> Well, part of the reason that horror is dying is everything is getting, for the most part, watered down so that they can get more people into the theaters to make money instead of actually making a good film. Right. And, they don't and, realize that good adult-oriented horror, guess what? More adults would go to the theaters and watch it. But who wants exactly. to go and have to listen to a bunch of 13-year-olds giggling, playing on their phones, and running around in a theater unsupervised? I celebrate yeah, I, when any movie gets exactly. an R rating. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love, I love it. Captain Spacer, it's, and I think it goes back to, I mean, <laughs> off topic for a second, to Deadpool, whoa, whoa, whoa. which was the first R rated Marvel movie, and yeah. that was a huge success. And when you know you see a movie trailer for a scary movie, and you're like, oh, this is gonna be so good, and then it's like PG thirteen, it's like yeah. fuck that. Yeah. It's not, yeah, it's like a big letdown. Like you see the trailer, and you're like, oh, this looks amazing, and you're like, rated PG thirteen, you're like, well, that's gonna suck. Yeah, and you, yeah. you can do some fine suspense films and thrillers and stuff like that with PG thirteen, but <laughs> I don't think you ever hit that fever pitch with an R that you do with an R rating. Or yeah. An NC seventeen, well, I mean, but that's a whole. You did with it. See, the the thing is, though, it depends on how you handle it. I'm interested to see what the home release of what it is going to look like because it's supposed to have some uncut scenes and stuff. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? But yeah. the fact the fact mm-hmm. that they went all out hard R with it, I think, is part of what makes the difference. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I think you get more originality out of R because you're not trying to get little kids you know, quote unquote little kids in your movie, you're wanting adults because Well it's I mean, it's not just know. that. It's like yeah. you can only show so much blood in a movie that's not rated R. You can yeah. only say so many cuss words in a movie that's not rated R. Right. So when you yeah. when you drop below that R rating, you're automatically hamstringing everything that you can do within the horror genre. And people seem to forget it's the horror genre. It's supposed to shock. It's supposed <laughs> right. to offend. It's supposed mm-hmm. to make your skin crawl. Mm-hmm. It, it should he gets it. not be watered down for the for <laughs> you know, so teenagers can watch it. It's that's not what it's supposed to do. And I like your example of the Green Inferno because I saw the trailer for it. It got a limited release. I couldn't find it in any theater to go watch it, so I had to wait until I could find it online. And I was like, wow. I mean, that's how it should be done. That there was no watering down of that. That's something that could totally Not happen to, you know, stupid kids who go to a country they don't understand. And, um, I, I mean, it, it was a great film. I was on the cannibal side the whole time. <laughs> uh, me too. I was like, eat them. Yay. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, Eli Roth, I mean, he had that slump for a while. But Eli Roth's always been good at gore and horror. Because he's definitely one of those people that horror is his life. Mm-hmm. And so he gets it. And horror, it, you know, with as society and cultural changes, so does the horror industry. And I think Eli Roth gets that because his first movie was Cabin Fever. Mm-hmm. And then we come to a couple years ago with The Green Inferno and whatever's next for him. And it's like, it's a total shift. Um, but he gets it. And I think <clears throat> with horror, we need more people like that with that originality where, yeah, you can take you know, zombies or vampires or supernatural serial killers or whatever, and then refresh it 
and make it like kind of revamp it and turn it into something new. But at what point is throwing more gore at something? Or I mean, there's no balance anymore. Mm. It's like, oh, we're, we're just going to shove a lot of gore in there and call it a horror flick, or we're going to shove a lot of bi- violence in there, and you're missing the. I mean, you, it's there's no balance in horror flicks. Part of, I get I get what you're saying, but part of, part of the problem is 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 you got to remember we're you know I'm 41, okay, so I grew up in the era of the 70s and 80s horror film, and what I've started to notice with a lot of the younger genre fans today is. One, they don't know their history. They don't realize that a lot of the stuff that they're watching now is based off of classics Mm -hmm. that they wouldn't even touch in a video store. Well, video stores don't exist anymore, but they they don't realize they don't realize that it's that it's there. And part of it is, is it's funny. We have become society has become so desensitized to violence that you can show a man get blown up on the news. You can show a, 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 an airplane explosion, a terrorist attack, and those things are all perfectly acceptable in the realms of television. Mm-hmm. But the second you slap the label horror on it, everyone becomes offended. There are a lot of things to unpack right there. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think one of the things that we truth no 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 when they show terrorist attacks and i think part of what you're even touching on and that we have to unpack that touches on the first thing you brought up is them not knowing the history is we have to kind of look at if we're talking about it being dead now in hollywood and how long it's been dead for we have to look at how many things to kind of go back to what you said too liz have changed in that time and and there's a big disconnect between generations that are consuming entertainment now and having an ability to have an appreciation for the fact that the movies that were made in the years when everybody wasn't connected to the internet at 24 seven, everyone didn't have a cell phone on them. Why things like not being able to call for help were actually a, 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 a point of peril for characters in a story. That's something that they for have sure. a very hard time um, identifying with. They actually kind and so if you can, if you can start, uh, to, if like, like if we want to make the analogy of raising a child, and if you can start exposing them to the cultural things that you want them to have as that foundational base early enough before they get completely overtaken by what we experience as technology now. I mean, the fact that we're doing this show on the internet is sort of walking the line of that double-edged sword. It lets us do shit like this. It sure. lets us be spread across countries, continents, and oceans. <laughs> and have a conversation that maybe someone out there listening in the industry might be like, holy fuck, this is our audience. This is what they're saying about us. <laughs> you know well, what I mean? We're supposed to be you know, them, you know? And the other interesting aspect is that people don't think about, if you look at the 70s, the 80s, you know, the stars of your horror films weren't the actors. They were your directors. They were your mm-hmm. special effects artists. I would go see a movie with Tom Savini just because it was Tom Savini doing mm-hmm. the effects. Yeah. You know, Giannetto De Rossi, things like that. Nowadays, when you go to a horror film and Tom Cruise is starring in The Mummy, well, guess no. what? We already know that Tom Cruise <laughs> is going to die. <laughs> if or, Jennifer Love Hewitt's in the film, Chris we Chris know Hemsworth. she's not going to die. Well, since you're Gilberting a little bit, I would love to. So, yeah, when you start putting. I was going to say. I would love to hear that. (laughs) You can hedge your. Those earlier films. Those earlier films. That was like. You didn't know who was going to live and who was (laughs) going to die. Now you do just by looking at the market. Yeah. The fact. I would just like to point out that that wasn't Stephen Hawking doing a little cameo on the show. That was still Michael talking. What the fuck? I just listened to this on the podcast. Oh, we just lost you for a minute, Michael. Yeah, you kind of you kind of skipped out, but I, I am really curious about uh, what Jeff's got to say about this. Yeah, W and Steve have to say about this as well. Uh, I, I knew the effects people better than I knew the actors back in the seventies. I mean, I'm 52, so you know when I was growing up, Fangoria was a when it came out as a as a new magazine, I was yeah. grabbing mm-hmm. the thing on the shelves because it was nothing else like it, and it would tell me what was coming. But all the stories were about how they were making this stuff, so it was always about the effects guys. So I'd go to these movies. I didn't know who was in it. I didn't care who was in it. I just knew who was doing the effects, so I knew it was going to be awesome. 
you know, and so oh I God, was, I'm so yeah. glad someone else read Fangoria growing up than mm-hmm. me. I was like, I, just, I have to have this. And yeah, yeah, that was my thing, you know, it was just to grab that magazine off the, I, I was there at 7-Eleven the day it would land. I, I knew what day it would come out. The guy that worked behind the counter, I'd walk in and he goes, they're going to be here about 10 minutes. Just relax. <laughs> I mean, it's that much of a regular thing for me. And he really sound like that, or was he more like a poo on fucking Simpsons telling you? No, nah, this was uh, this pre revolution. <laughs> so yeah, his name was Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they used to the make that area. joke back then, man. Yeah, yeah, you know, that he, was the he time. Was, you know, like he was ever get back to. He was a pretty. He was a pretty laid back dude because Seven Eleven was starting to throw some of those policies out there about what they'd sell to who and everything else like that, and trying to put minor restrictions on things kind of towards the end, at least where I was living, because at the time I was living in the South, um, we'd left Seattle and gone down to Florida. And so, you know, that, that's kind of backwoodsy. So, but oh, grunge, dude. And now the, the, the problem that you have now is nobody has any sense of attention because the, everybody is always so, everything has to change so quick. You'll come out of a movie and people are like, oh, that was too long. Because mm-hmm. if it's over an hour and 25 minutes, people start to start to nod off. There's no longer, I mean, a two hour movie is considered an art film now, you know, I mean, but you look back, I mean, The Exorcist comes in at what, two hours and eight minutes or something like that. Yeah. Movies had set up, they had characters. You didn't just get the demon in the first scene. You got set up and you got characters. That's what people have bitched about with this, uh, with, with The Walking Dead as it's progressed. They go through series, you know, kind of runs where they build character and let you know who some of these people are. Otherwise, their death is meaningless. If you didn't get those deep, the farmhouse moments between between Maggie and Glenn, Glenn's death has no meaning. There's no purpose to it. Right. If you don't get those moments, then they're just another person being ripped apart. But nobody wants to sit through that now. They don't want to sit through character development. They just want the next scene. They want the next clip or the next blurb, and that's kind of where they're stuck at. Well, and I think that's the reason why you see so many remakes because they've already developed the characters and they don't have to spend that time on character development now. All they got to do is jump into the, the scene because, well, it's it's a remake. They They know who this character is. Yeah, and I feel like that kind of, I feel like character development is so important for horror movies because then, like you said, then you care about the characters and if they get slashed up in a, like a chainsaw or whatever... You know, you're just kind of like, eh. But I mean, with remakes, it's you know, you kind of cut out that that origin, you know, character development, which I, in my honest opinion, is so important regardless of what type of movie. Um, because I mean, I feel like you know, great horror movies are also great stories, and a lot of horror movies these days aren't. Which I feel like why I love Blumhouse so much because it's story first. And then horror second, but it's still important, you know, because it's Blumhouse Productions. But yeah, I like them because they give me paychecks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's your opinion? Jeff is probably the same thing. <laughs> I do have a complaint though, is that they are going a little bit more mainstream Hollywood. Even Blumhouse has been affected by this because now you know they they have these blockbuster franchises like Insidious. Um, so to see something like Get Out. Uh, that Jordan Peele did, who is a comedian, mm-hmm. you know, and the success that it had. And, and that movie I watched, I'm like, wow, that was kind of different. I mean, it made me think of Sedford Wives a little bit, but it's more of uh, what are people, what are people really afraid of these days? And it's more um, ide- ide- different ideologies and people who think differently. And, oh my God, you know, the worst thing would be if someone thought I was a racist, you know, I would have voted, I would have voted, voted for Obama a third term if I could have. Um, and, and then you, you know, you see from the main character's perspective of how, you know, he does have to be on guard and kind of afraid of someone who isn't black because, you know, I think they just hijacked some guy and, you know, the, the grand out his personality <laughs> uh, yeah it's really out his funny. personality and you know the the lawn guy is really grandpa and holy shit i'm about to be brain snatched and body snatched here and you know i mean the scene where she is stirring the tea and puts him under hypnosis and he just like boom back into his chair into that abyss i was just like Okay, that's really like on a psychological level what where horror I think has gone. It's 
not, um, you know, is someone going to come and kill me or is, you know, aliens or werewolves or, you know, what, what have you is people are really afraid of being wrong. People are afraid of being called racist and people are afraid of anything that might upset their mental framework uh, mm -hmm. and make them have to think. And we're to a point as, as a society where anything that challenges, like, your thinking, whether you're on the right or you're on the left, if it challenges your worldview and it goes against your grain, you're just like, I can't accept it. Hey, and Jeff, that's what people are afraid of now. I want to throw this over to Jeff real quick because I want to get his take on that. Are people really afraid of of being labeled when they... Is, I mean, is, is that something that's even a thought? I think so. I think the whole... We're talking about Hollywood, the disconnect... I think is that they don't know what people are afraid of these days. I don't think um, Jennifer brought up a great point about being labeled as a racist and homophobic. And, you know, my opinion doesn't match with this person's opinion. So my God, I'm a horrible person. And I think with Hollywood just doing the endless remakes and everything, they're losing, I don't want to say content, but some potentially interesting stories that they could develop out of the way the times are going. That or they go to the they go to the extreme and and I think it ruined American Horror Story this year. They went, they made such a. They, people are seeing this on the news every day. This is not what you want from your entertainment because it was that immersed in it. I mean, instead of giving them a story, I mean, yeah, okay, we want to throw in the, now he's going to be Charles Manson, now he's going to be Jim Jones. Now, but I mean, lots of people that I talked to this year were just really turned off by this season. Yeah, I was not impressed by it. I thought, okay, well, I'll watch it. I'll see where it's going to go. It was a little intriguing at first, but I haven't even watched the last episode, and it's been sitting in my queue for, like, ever. And I'm like, I, I don't even care how it ends because I watch this horror story every day on the news. Yeah. I stopped watching American Horror Story last season, so I kind of I, I kind of fell out of love with it during Rome. Well, no. Build it. Just, oh, no. But what I used I to love about it ago. was that it was it was sort of like the Stranger Things of horror before <laughs> Stranger Things came out. You know what I mean? Like they were taking all these familiar tropes and ideas and turning them on their head and like mixing them together and mutating them and making them different. And like each season would have so many layers of different things going on. And some seasons were far more successful than others. But up until Burger I, House blew my mind. I was like, oh, my God. Hotel was my favorite season that they did uh, until i uh, you know i stopped watching so i don't know if he'll ever get that good again but um i think that's one of the things that is more needed now too but like you're saying if you're trying to do it to be edgy and you're taking something that's too close to the psyche damage that all of our society is kind of dealing with right now it's gonna backfire on you you know i mean get out probably came close to doing that but i think jordan peele has a a much better sensibility of how to present these things in, in a way that he you're going to still laugh. There was a lot of cynical humor in there. And I think you need to do that to ease into, ease into this. Yeah. We lost Drew, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did and, leave Drew, and I'm hoping he gets back here soon. I sent him a message, but he, his internet crap. You know, the him, the so. thing is though, part, part of what made horror successful through the early years was the fact that it tackled our social taboos, you know, while people talk about tropes, I mean, you know, uh, premarital sex, drugs, drinking, you know, horror films play upon our our taboos and our fears. And, and the thing is, from a historical standpoint, people don't stop and think, if you think about all the things that you're allowed to see in, in film and TV today, a lot of that stuff came from horror. Don't forget that until Psycho was made, you weren't allowed to see an unmarried man and woman lying in bed like you did in the beginning of the film. Mm. You never saw a toilet flush in a film before you saw it in Psycho. Horror films are the ones that break the taboos that make it socially acceptable for it to be in your dramas, your comedies, your romantic films, your adventure films. So people forget sometimes that horror is really the historical marker when it comes to any kind of filmmaking. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it definitely has always been the genre that pushes the envelope. I think in a in a in like a tactile like human emotion kind of way, but I mean, you it definitely can't hold the candle to things like the way Star Wars changed the way films were made after that. I mean, there there are definitely levels of I think the sort of 
the uncomfortability that a, a horror movie will make you feel over a sci-fi movie or an adventure movie. Like the level of danger in an adventure movie doesn't feel the same as if you're in a fucking hostel where they're going to chop you the fuck up while you're alive and awake. And like you're passing by a room and see your friend being fucking uh, dissected after just being freshly killed. And like that, like that, even if you don't watch any more of the movie, your mind has that idea in it now. You know what I mean? Like I, I have not had, uh, time where after that where I haven't put myself in those positions here at times you know what I mean where you're like what the fuck would I do if I woke up chained to a chair and all the shit in the room I knew they were going to use to start fucking cutting me to pieces that definitely left a splinter in there you know like that's that's the kind of shit that horror will do as well you know that I think the horror- answer is simple I think the answer is cry <laughs> <laughs> just sit around and cry I mean the only thing I would say I hate is things like the human centipede like that was another way of horror pushing an envelope that i'm like okay do we really need to do this like this is uh yeah but see now but see you bring, up, scary. you bring that movie up but that's an interesting point when we talk about originality and horror that was a movie that was original yeah as bad as it was it was original right? <laughs> Um, so I asked my daughter, I'm like, so what scares the shit out of you and your friends? She's like, okay, human centipede, that's horrifying. That's fucking horrifying just because I can't imagine, you know, waking up chained to a hospital bed and then being shown, you know, because he shows them the plans of what he's going to do. And then it actually happening, you know, you, you just, and, and I said, okay, well, what else? She's like, well, creepy clowns definitely, you know, fuck us up. Um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're out about that. Um, they're definitely scared of like anything paranormal, like Ouija boards and things like that. Um, but not like straight up demons and things like that, because they, they're like, you know, a lot of horror that we watch, you know, like some of the older stuff, um, we're like, oh yeah, it's funny. Mm-hmm. Like they're, they're laughing at it, <laughs> whereas you know we, we watched it, and we were like Whoa, terrified at their age. Um, so I mean, I think today's youth are a little more cynical. Um, they're not necessarily going to the movies in the same way that we did when they we were their age. Um, so definitely, I think getting rid of the PG thirteen um, because they're not going to the movies anyway. They're staying at home. They're watching YouTube. They're on creepy pasta, reading you know stuff, and then they'll wait and they'll watch the R rated versions, the director's cuts, when it comes out on streaming or DVD. So uh, they're watching the harder core stuff anyway, and they're not going to the movie theaters to do it. And I asked my daughter, I'm like, so what movies would you actually go to if at the movie theaters? Um, because I, I see a decline, <laughs> you know, actually people. <laughs> the movies especially younger people and she's like well a big movie like it that you know a a lot of um uh hype was surrounding it you know there's a lot of promotion about it uh a lot of people are like oh this is a the remake to see and so a lot of young people went and saw that in the theater um but that was a weird because it tied into like the social since social media sensation of like the clowns that were popping out and chasing exactly for the last two years mixed with the older generation's version of reading the book and the TV series. Yeah, and so and they said stuff like Split really like messed them up because that could happen in real life. What if I got kidnapped by this crazy person? And they didn't really find it scary more than when he started climbing the walls. That's what got my daughter. Like she was okay up until the point where he starts climbing the walls. <laughs> so so I'm trendy though to start working, uh, start playing on people's fears versus just going out and creating horror though that's that's really seems to be what's going on i mean you go back to even like one hour photo that was the creepiest damn movie i ever seen but Mm -hmm. it was scary but yet it was a horror film i mean that's what they tried to to market it as yeah i think a lot of psychological thrillers get billed as horror when they're really thrillers well that's what i find funny is like horror in the box office isn't necessarily a huge success, but yet every trailer you see that's remotely scary is cut like a horror trailer. Mm. Mm. I don't get it. (laughs) It doesn't make any sense to me. And then if if horror is a genre that pushes boundaries, I'm curious as to where where we're going to go next with it. Because we are oversaturated. We're desensitized to a lot of violence and a lot of really everything. So what's the next... What's the next album? Yeah. Kids can go online and see beheadings. They can go online and see the actual <laughs> Columbine footage. My kids have done it. Uh, so, oh, I mean, geez. 
no my, wonder my daughter so was it. yeah my daughter yeah. was was having to read the columbine you know thousand page book that the the journalist put out and she and all her classmates went and watched the real footage and then she got really freaked out and started you know noticing things like when we dropped my son off to his middle school, oh, that'd be really easy to shoot that window out and that window out. You just take everyone out in the in the um, lunchroom. <coughs> and so she got she and her friends, you know, they had to you know sit down and like, OK, the likelihood of a, an active shooter being at your school, like because that really messed with them. And so I think, yeah, they, they are desensitized to a point where, you know, real life things that could happen um, because they can YouTube it now. And it's out there free to watch um, affects them more than than a movie because a movie isn't real to them. Yeah. Well, then maybe we should go back to basics. I I think you're going to see that. I think we're going to go back to more of an environmental horror because of of where we're at with everything. And people are really cognizant about that because back in the 80s, all you have to do is twist out, you know, the, the entire nuclear exchange with the with the global warming event and keep you know, don't turn it into water world with Kevin Costner, for God's sakes, but make it something that's actually scary. And I think that you can do this and make it, I mean, this would be horrifying. I mean, you're talking about your entire food chain collapsing, you know, so what's, what's going to happen on the tail end of that? What are people going to turn into? And I think you get, like you were saying uh, earlier, Dave, is the whole thing with the, the hills have eyes, people kind of coming up out of the, you know, out of the muck to do what it is they do you know and i think that that's that's the that's the ricochet that maybe we're headed towards and i don't think that's a bad thing i mean you also i think there there's something that i think we could find movies that actually aren't horror movies there are elements of those stories that could be scary too like what you're talking about where where there's the collapse of a society you have something like children of men where oh we can't even have children anymore and you know, the kind of horrific thing pe- things people are doing to each other the sort of cult like um, way that people band together and start believing in, uh, you know, uh, random offshoot religions in the end times. You know, there's a lot of things that happen in movies that aren't even in horror movies that if you get trapped in like a, a sort of internal feedback loop thinking about them, it could really take your mind to really, really twisted and dark places. And I mean, I think there are movies that toyed with some of the things like that that failed miserably. But like, look at what the trailers for a movie like The Happening made it look like where it was just all these images of people and then it was awful and, and the movie itself was like abhorrent don't even watch it but like the but the, the trailer was was phenomenal i mean that cascade of people just jumping off of an active construction site and the uh, the sort of passing the baton gun suicide on the street of new york like the idea of that there would be something that would just make people kill themselves and we're just getting seeing all these images of these mass suicides it's sort of like Okay, dude, you know what? This is playing in a sandbox that I guess conceivably could happen. Where, you know, let's see what this is about. And you go into that already disturbed, and then you get handed like a pile of shit. But, you know, it's, it's like this could be the time where someone could come up with a concept like that and actually make it a movie that has this really epic impact, like a Dunkirk of horror. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or like an inception of horror. Now you you kind of bring that up, but is there some such a thing as too soon? Because we've we've gone through life events over the course of the last ten years that a lot of people would consider as being horrific. Now, is there as as a writer or as a filmmaker, is there a too soon uh, boundary? You don't really want to step in that before you, before the sensitivities kind of die out, or is that how horror should be done? hit that too soon button i don't know if sensitivity is ever gonna die out today like if the media doesn't like it or social media doesn't like it it ain't gonna be seen it doesn't yeah. matter people will actually I I mean, part of it the amount of campaigning that's kind of part of being uh, a member of social media you know i mean how many things Terrible. in your news feed every day are a petition for like Something that you're like, you actually have time to give a fuck about this. Exactly. You know what I mean? so, like commenting on the social stuff that's happening in horror, I think you're you're penciling to a corner because as soon as one person finds it offensive, which will happen, it gets taken out. I and think we, that's bad because I think we horror <laughs> is a genre that should offend you. I, I think mean, anything, anything creative like that should be, give, be given a free pass. If you don't like it, don't watch it. Don't buy it. Don't rent it. 
Don't support I mean, it. like, look Don't at a thing it. like the Toxic Avenger. I mean, look at the trauma <laughs> films. You know, I mean, that thing is like a half porno, half gore fest, over the top, exaggerated, dark <laughs> comedy oh. horror movie. So. Oh. And- yeah. <laughs> now someone watching that now someone like 15 watching that now 16 watching that now would probably not make it through the first 15 minutes of the movie you know what i mean everything from the film stock to the fact that it's a world they are so far away from that they can't even conceive of you know that immediately starts putting it in this thing that gets labeled stupid <laughs> you know what i mean and like fuck that let me see what's one on one triggered tween with a hashtag to take down your 200 million dollar film yeah. So, that's all it takes today. Yeah. So to answer your question, Chris, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm waiting for a new Silence of the Lambs kind of thing. You know what I mean? Something that's going to be that like cerebral, uh, but yet uh, yeah, that's have it have enough like disturbingly gross, gory stuff that it could count as horror, but it really is like preying on sort of the darker side of humanity. Um, and I feel like Mindhunter is kind of there, but that's a series. I mean, I feel it, it could yeah. maybe also speak to the fact that everything's going in that direction. The stream. Yeah, a lot of things are shows and not movies now. That's where all the good content is headed. And even John Cusack said it in the Q&A that we attended at DragonCon. He's like, unless you're willing to like slap on a pair of tights and be in the, that blockbuster movie about a superhero, um, you're not going to get a good content story. You're not going to get good box office numbers. <coughs> all the good content has gone to television or streaming. So is television stealing all the good space in horror then? Well, streaming television is. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be yeah. a matter of time before Hollywood picks that up. I mean, it'll take one great independent horror film for them to start making the same formulaic thing off of that. Like, I know Chris Rock did it a few years ago with comedy. He made his own, financed his own comedy film to put it out because he didn't want bosses telling him what he could and could not put in. And guess what? It was hilarious. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just, it might take some of that to... uh re jumpstart this thing and it's like places like netflix that are giving artists that kind of creative freedom to do that type of thing you know and and so right. it seems like i don't know how you know depending on how you want to look at it you know i i look at that as an opportunity to have you know eight hours of an awesome horror idea delivered to me at once or 10 hours at once and then you know if i don't like it after three i won't watch it i'll go watch you know, glitch or <laughs> the oa or something else you know but uh, <laughs> I know. Uh, it picked up for a second season, so. Yes, thank God, thank God. You know, but I'm glad say- you- Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's all right, man. I was gonna say- what got picked up for a second season? My My- oh, okay. I was glad that you brought up Netflix and how they're they're um, um, putting money, I guess, into productions in, into Netflix originals and things like that. Um, Spectral is is in their horror flick niche or genre or whatever you category and i watched that and i guess a lot of people now my daughter watched it with me and she didn't feel that it was horror she thought it was more like sci-fi thriller type thing but uh, i think it it resonated i think it resonated a little bit differently with me because i i i was a soldier so i i recognized certain things that happened in that do you think that's maybe something that you're going to see more of is them taking something that, uh, like, for example, there's, I mean, nobody in the United States is not touched by, by what has happened over the course of the last 15 years. You either know someone who served or you're a relative of someone who served or you, you've, you've served yourself. Do you think that's a, a, a direction that you're going to start seeing people now that this time has passed? For horror? You know, yeah. that people like people bring back oh, the absolutely. actual horror stories of like the reality of what's going on. Yeah, I, mean, I feel like reality in, in mixing reality with horror, because that's what's made horror. What's I mean, playing on people's fears is what made horror what horror is. I, I would love that as an idea for a film. I fear that politics would take control of that and you would hmm. you just get backlash. Nothing so it drops, it drops back into the independence lap then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it's going to depend on what delivery systems are even available uh, with some of the sort of legislative horrors that are uh, <laughs> being bandied about out there. And I think that would affect a lot of how this even moves forward. So that's something that we have to kind of keep in consideration with the technology aspect as well. I mean, uh, 
were horror movies the first ones to do the 3D thing back in the 50s? You know, where 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 did that start? Because again, I think you know, if we want to go back to where this all began with the idea of the horror being morality tales to try to stop premarital teen sex, you know, I mean, what it, is Black Mirror our, our, our real horror for today? Because it's showing us what we're becoming or what we could become. You know, things like I consider that. Black Mirror horror. Oh yeah, it's a scary ass fucking show. I'm like, that could that happen? And I think the best the best stories always have a grain of truth to them. That it could be possible. And that's what really hooks people and gets into your head and makes it truly terrifying. Yeah, I mean, you know, kind of like Silence of the Lambs or I mean, if you really know your history, the strangers. Um, because there is, I mean, yeah, like, The Strangers was kind of ridiculous, but it was also based on the Ketty murders, which is, like, a totally, like, fucked up situation, so I think, of course, a little bit of reality, um, goes a long way, but with society and how it is, because we are oversaturated, and, I mean, our imagination probably is as long as the internet, you know, the internet is about as long as our imagination can take us, so... I mean, going having to go back to independent movies because I mean, I feel like that's where a lot of the good, like the, what we consider classics, to be indie films. I mean, I feel, I mean, coming to mind is The Evil Dead in a way, because um, that's just, I mean, I feel like that opened so many doors in the way of horror, and it was just three friends who had an idea and was like, "Let's see what we can do." So, yeah. But I don't, well, well, part, with a part, of, part of that comes down to, yeah. though, is that, you know, they were living in a, in, in a point and a time where they didn't have everyone telling them, you can do this, you can do that. You know, it was kind of like what was brought up earlier. You know, right. mm -hmm. if you don't, what happened to the time when if you didn't like what was on TV, you didn't watch it. If you didn't like the song, you know, you changed the station. Right. If you didn't like the book, you don't read it. You know, it's, it's well, you know, this, the sad thing is, is, is that, you know, for a lot of these films, especially when you're talking about Hollywood stuff and they do these test market groups and stuff like this, you know, they're not bringing horror fans in to comment on how these films are getting made. They're bringing in the soccer moms. They're bringing in the people that watch Disney movies, romantic comedy, <laughs> all of these other things, but they're not bringing in the horror fans. Well, why the hell are you asking people who aren't horror fans and who wouldn't even watch the film anyway if they find this socially acceptable or is this okay? Because what they, they need to do is focus on the actual target audience. Stop worrying about what everyone else said. I, I got to disagree with you there. I do believe they are looking at the, the target audience. It's just right now the target audience is so uh, mind fucked with superhero films that they're you're branching across several different genres. Um, you know, any smart marketer is not going to say, oh, hey, let's go ask the fucking guy that likes comedies about horror films. They're not going to do that. Marketers are way smarter than what we want to give them credit for. And to be fair, the last time we did statistics on it, something like sixty-four percent of the but audience. You got to remember, though, we're not females. we're not talking about. So some of them are going to be soccer moms. <laughs> yeah. That's um, just say statistically. That voice with Drew Carson, he's back. Yeah, welcome back, Drew. <laughs> Yeah, back from the fucking dark. That was weird. <laughs> the gods don't want you talking about this shit, man. <laughs> you no, but I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Okay, a good example would be a movie like uh, Rob Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses. I, I was hoping someone would bring this up. Thank God. Okay, <laughs> movie got movie got made. Movie got made. Sat on the shelf. You know why it didn't get released when he finished making it? Because the test audience, the people that know, the people that the studios brought in to watch it, a lot of them were not horror movie fans. Because and they commented that it was too violent. Fans. Now, so, let me ask you this. Any true, any true red-blooded horror fan that you know would sit there and tell you that House of a Thousand Corpses was too violent? We've been screaming for that kind of film for years. Someone finally delivers it, and the studio gets too chicken shit to put it out. Look at high tension. 
High Tension was supposed to be the first NC-17 rated movie released in the United States. Do you know what movie beat it to the theaters? Showgirls. Hmm. Showgirls was rated NC-17 and everyone shit their pants because they thought NC-17 meant sex. Yeah. So no. Well, it's Showgirls it did though. 50 <laughs> seconds from that film <laughs> to get it in theaters. Whereas it would have been a more novel act had it been the first NC-17 rated horror film released to American theaters. They let people who don't have any liking or say in the industry have sway over what we get to see. And the reason you know this is because look at the DVD market. What happens the minute the movie gets out of the theaters? The unrated 40 minutes of extra footage director's cut comes out. Well, if you had just shown that version in the theater, the people that really wanted to see it would have gone to see it anyway. Yeah, but aren't we to blame for that? Because the moment a movie starts getting a sniff of, of coming out, people line up to talk about how it's going to be crap and how it's not going to be this, it's not going to be that, it's not going to match up to whatever book they read or whatever. So it comes out to all this negativity and then nobody goes to see it. And instead of going to see something that, you know, that's groundbreaking and epic and new, they go back to what's comfortable. And that's what that's what the society has become. We've become enmeshed in comfort. If it makes us uncomfortable, we don't want to be a part of it. Because everybody now, the moment something makes you uncomfortable, you can complain and turn it into a lawsuit. You know, I mean, that's, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, if, if, if you watch TV now and see what's going on out there, I mean, I, I was talking to, about this with Drew the other day. Uh, you know, you get this this Matt Lauer thing that, that breaks the news the other day, and it was one person. And I got done talking to Drew, and I told my wife, I said, within two hours, there's going to be five people that are going to jump on that bandwagon because they want to be put them they want to be put on the news. And that's just it. That's where everybody has gravitated now. They've gravitated to pop culture, mindless crap, and then they want to rush someplace to feel good. They don't want to be scared. They don't want this. And kids today, I mean because I've got three of them between the ages of 19 and 24, and they just, they don't get into things like we did. You know, when we were younger, we, when we found something we liked, I mean, we watched that movie five, six, seven, eight times. They, once they, they're one and done on pretty much anything, mm-hmm. you know? So, so there's no, you don't go back to the theater, to the theater and see a movie six, seven, eight, nine times. I mean, here, the original Star Wars, uh, when it came out, uh, there was a theater by where I live. They had a running tally of how many days consecutively that movie had played there, you know, and it was reaching close to, you know, 300 and something days or what have you. A movie is considered successful now if it's not out on DVD within six weeks. You know, yeah. it's done a good theater run if it doesn't hit DVD in six weeks, and that's just it. And the other part of that is look at the entertainment systems we have at home. You know, yeah. we have, in Atlanta, everyone has a huge basement room set up just like a movie theater. And it, 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 their sound system, their screen. I mean, it's just like being in a movie theater, but more comfortable. And if you want to pause the movie, you can. Mm-hmm. I mean, and when you've got that, why go to the movies? Yeah, you don't have to deal with the public, which is like, thank <laughs> fucking God. Yeah. Um, which is why I like the Dolby Cinema Theaters. They started doing that. They made it more like your basement where now the only people have to deal with is kind of like a couple people on either side of you. They have these big giant dividers. The sound is incredible. The screen's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're making it more and more enticing to keep going there. We they have even recliners. Tables. Yeah. Yeah. They recline. They're leather recliners. <laughs> but yeah. like electric recline, you push the button, and you're like, whoa. Fantastic. Speaking and the price of, I actually tie prices at the arsenals who've been able to attend it. Yeah, that's, that's I guess that's what well. they're trying to do, right? Just like Disney World. It's like, hey, yeah, fuck you. Um, but I also did almost fall asleep in one of those. And I was like, man, you know, when that happens at home, I'm just like, oh, shit. I rewind it and I pick up where I left off. I don't go, how many fucking people just heard me snoring? Did I fuck <laughs> like what the hell just happened here um but the other thing which was interesting that you brought up earlier was that um that they don't get into things the same way we did i remember and this is something i brought up when i was on a panel at la geek uh back in uh, march or in, in april this past year is that horror used to be defined by the sort of iconic characters of the genre you know like there was a period of time where horror was sort of 
almost uh, completely ruled by people like Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees and Michael Myers in a much different way than when they remade the movies now. And the way we got into it, a lot of it, at least people in my generation, the people in my age bracket was because we all had, I mean, I was the older sibling in my family, but all my friends had older brothers and sisters who were the ones that like, you know, let you watch the tape when mom and dad said you couldn't watch it because it was too scary, you know, and, and every one of my friends by first grade had seen every Freddy movie that was out at that point. And I was the last one to the table on that shit. And it was a big deal. It was like a, a social status thing almost for a little while. And it was I don't, a message, yeah. Yeah. And I don't see that happening. Like no one gives a fuck if you saw Insidious or not, you know, like sometimes that's how you know how you're going to wind up hanging out with people is you're like, oh, thank God you give a shit about watching movies as much as I do. Thank fuck got it found you um, they're not a bets anymore yeah there There's was the movies come out now for them to be events true there's not enough time for any event no. to have any lasting power no everything no just um there was this one movie that was banned in the u.s and they fought and fought and fought to get it released and it's called clown and it's an independent film and it's basically surrounds um the story is a, a real estate agent finds his old clown suit in the attic and he, his kid wants a clown in his birthday party. Well, the clown cancels and his, his wife calls him and says, Hey, you know, the clown canceled and he just found this suit. And so he puts it on. Well, the suit ends up transforming him into this creature. And to me, like, I, I have no idea why this was fucking banned in, in the U S for so long. Like even the trailer or not, not the trailer, the, the poster, which is not even horrifying to me, was banned because, you know, it was like the bloody clown and, you know, he, he's rough looking. But, I mean, it finally, I finally got to watch it and I'm like, really? Okay, it showed a, a kid getting killed and there was like, you know, blood everywhere. Is, is, was that what, you know, got it banned? Because for the life of me, I cannot understand why it was banned. I mean, it's an interesting and new take on, you know, the creepy killer clown when genre. It, but when did it come out? I'm wondering if the studios behind it, <laughs> yeah, like, right, put, like strong on that film so they could get all the revenue for creepy clown film in theaters. It's been on Netflix for quite a while. I keep seeing it as I scan by, and I just haven't stopped to watch it because it doesn't interest me long enough to make me want to take. <laughs> it's, it's decent. I mean, it's worth a watch. Um, I died. But my kids, my kids watch that, and they're like, "Holy shit!" And I'm like, "Really?" So. Yeah. It would only be fun if I brought over my daughter. I have one daughter that's terrified of clowns, so that would be the only time I would I, I would enjoy watching her watch it. <laughs> that <laughs> movie, that movie's directed by the guy who just did the new Spider Man movie. If that tells you anything, okay, there you go. Uh, wait, now is he the same guy who also did Fright Night? Is that is it all the same Todd Holland or no? Not no. the same. No. No, no, no. Okay, thank God. <laughs> that, that, I, that would be a, that would be like sixty five year old, seven year old Spider Man if it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kept saying the name. Totally I'm like, no movie. fucking way. How are this many? People they won't even make Aunt May that old now. <laughs> There's like so many people with the same names. I mean, I guess that also goes to the fact of Hollywood being a closed system. Yeah, you and, know, and being disconnected. You're actually more likely to get the the fucking wanker that played Spider Man on this show than the fucking director. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I love Fright Night. I would love to talk that, to him on. That was a choice film. I, I could watch it over and over and over again. And the remake, I was like, this is like complete garbage. And to the point where I'm like one of those parents where like, okay, we've just watched the remake of Fright Night. And I'm pissed. And I'm like, whoa, that was cool. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. And I'm like the kind of parent, I'm like, you're going to watch the original shit. You're going <laughs> to understand where this comes from. It is my parental duty for you to know your movie history. If nothing else, I will leave you with this legacy. That and music. But that, <laughs> at that point, though, it's already too late because they've seen the new version yeah. first, which everyone and, first imprints you. You know what I mean? Uh, and that's part of the disconnect yeah. problem we have. Um, and I think with me, because my, my parents, I came from a super super conservative household and my parents were very against me watching horror until one day when I was about like 11 12 maybe 13 when my dad finally was like okay if she's serious about you know wanting to watch horror and being interested in horror I'm going to start her off right and he started me off with the evil dead and I had kind of started myself on watching the Halloween films starting from 1978 all the way through the sequels up until that point which was about resurrection yeah 
which was horrible. Yeah, I was so excited because I thought you were going to say your first movie you watched was like Boris Karloff's Frankenstein, but yeah, yes, that's, yeah, but that's, see, the, that's the difference though. Like even for yeah. you, the 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 line of classic is pushed further mm-hmm. back. You know, yeah. What I mean, I mean but my but I mean, my father, my dad was really big on the fifties sci-fi, so mm. I could definitely understand where he came from with the whole cult following type of genre. Um, you know, but I mean, he wasn't really so much into horror as I am slash was at that time. So, I mean, he just kind of started off with what he thought was best, which was the evil dead, because Mm -hmm. that was his favorite horror movie. He has a huge bro crush on Bruce Campbell. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to start right here. And then you can branch out in whatever direction you want to go. I've just noticed something, right? Is it just me that thinks Sangwich looks like Jeff 10 years ago? (laughs) <laughs> who we did not coordinate this <laughs> oh oh wow uh, before <laughs> after <laughs> that's that's very funny before woodstock after woodstock yeah <laughs> I, I think you guys gonna have to start calling each other and coordinating your outfits the thing is on the after, after. Yeah. <laughs> or like You're before the- con after con uh, yeah, I remember watching my first um, horror movie, and it was Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I promised my parents they were going to the drive-in to see it. And I said, "I promise, I'm going to go to sleep in the back. Just please take me, because you paid by the car." And they're like, "Okay, yeah, yeah, whatever." I watched the whole damn thing. I loved it, and I've been a fan of horror ever since. Can't tell you why, but I, I just have. And and so that's that was the very first thing I saw. And so I actually sought out some of the older stuff like I wanted to see the original Night of the Living Dead and I wanted to see the original and because we had satellite TV you know they played a lot of that stuff when HBO and Cinemax and Showtime and all of those channels were new because you know there weren't a lot of things you know out there to play yet you know it wasn't like the endless collection that we have now so um I I mean I have different levels of classes I guess I guess I I've seen Nosferatu which, you know, is a silent film, the first Dracula film. And um, I've, I've seen the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And, yeah, and, and I really view uh, film, even horror films, as art because there's an art to the, the effects, the makeup, and making things look realistic and making things uh, look scary. And it, it's an absolute art. And I find it fascinating not only to be pushed out of my comfort zone but also you know to to see just you know how far i can push myself before i'm like oh my god i'm too i'm too creeped out and i've never been to to that point where i'm like no i can't watch this so (laughs) i don't think we'll get to that point ever again i think we've pushed ourselves out of that uh you know i only have one movie that ever put me there and that was the original exorcist and that's because i watched it when i was uh well 72 so i was seven um you know i mean my mother was working in the theater at the time and we were the big theater in town because we had two screens and uh bambi was playing in one room and exorcist was in the other and i was told to not go in to see the exorcist so obviously that's where i went (laughs) even to this day even as desensitized as as i've become to what i've watched uh, to this day, that movie still, when the, during the Captain Howdy sequence, makes the hair on my arms and the back of my neck stand up because it was such an impacting movie then. But I don't think we'll see impact like that anymore. You know, I mean, the last movie that gave me the creeps was the first Nightmare on Elm Street. It didn't really scare me. It, it creeped me out quite a bit, but it didn't really scare me. I just I haven't been scared since then. So yeah. I've, got a, I've got a question I want to throw at Jeff real quick. Um, and the question is about the uh, special effects now in, in horror. Do you think special effects has kind of killed the ability to be uh, original? CGI has. Yes. CGI uh-huh. has killed Can you, everything. Can you expand? I agree with that 100%. As an effects artist, I agree 100%. Yeah, I, I'm I'm old school. I grew up with, like all you said, Fangoria and, um, you know, the Universal Monster movies. And the first, matter of fact, the first horror film I ever saw on television was Creature from the Black Lagoon. The first horror movie I saw in the theaters was Alien oh, in 1979. Nice. So I grew up with makeup effects 
animatronics, people in creature suits and everything. And now when you watch like the last alien movie and it's just CGI aliens running around, it's, it's just, mm. You know, it's a fucking I mean, video game. Watch You're watching a video game, game on a big screen. I feel, I feel like, that's, like that's every genre. That's not just horror. That's every single it's genre. Every, yeah. But I feel it's... like CGI has taken the labor of love out of it because you yes. put so much time and effort into you know the the special effects, the makeup, the the animatronics. There's so much labor of love because you know people are so <laughs> passionate about doing that. And then CGI. I mean, not that I'm saying CGI isn't hard work. I'm sure it is. It's just the labor of love element is kind of missing with CGI. It's disconnected because it's I might, yeah. production. I might be the only dissenting voice. Production. Uh oh. <laughs> I, I, I might know. be the only dissenting voice because what? While I, I agree with the the bullet points you're making, but by the same token, it's allowed things to be made that would have never happened before. And, and that's Thrones totally never fair. Yeah. Without CGI, yeah. Game of Thrones does not exist. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I think I if CGI you. can enhance something, I'm all for it. And if it can make us landscapes that we normally can't see, I just, for me, it's just when you see blood splatters in CGI, I'm just automatically turned off. Yeah. It, it's like everything next- else. If you overdo it, right. then it's a waste. But I mean, Balance. I think it was a, I think it's a good addition to film, but it's becoming a crutch for many people. And yeah. that, again, goes back to the fact that people want, more right now in quick bursts and not something that develops over time. You know, that's, 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 but see, a- that's, you, you bring up an interesting point though, when you say that, that CGI, you know, we wouldn't get a lot of what we have today. I mean, it's like you look at horror though, and, and, and what has CGI brought to the horror genre that we haven't already had? Back in 1981, we had the best damn werewolf transformation sequence you've ever seen when you, oh, yeah. The Howling and an American Werewolf in London. What did what did uh, Underworld bring us? CGI vampire or CGI werewolf? <laughs> Underworld. I, I couldn't compare. Couldn't compare. Actually, like, I don't the first know. Underworld, <laughs> he made sure to do practical werewolves, guys. I'm sorry, I watched the uh, behind the scenes on that one. <laughs> but, but, but I mean, that's that's what I'm saying is is what has CGI brought to horror that we haven't seen? Demons. Uh, I seem to recall Legend having a pretty good. <laughs> demon in it that didn't require any cgi it's i really think that what it has come down to is it's come down to laziness it's cheaper to pay someone to sit behind the computer than to pay someone who has talent to do physical makeup it ruins the suspension of disbelief the second i see cgi in a horror film yeah cgi has brought us shot and and yeah. i don't get paid for those types of movies is there truth to the rumor, and I may be wrong, but on the thing remake or reboot, whatever, they originally were going to intend to use practical effects, and then some genius said eh, it's all going to be CGI? Yeah. Yep. I remember reading yeah, that they, at some point in time. They that cut they were the go old original budget, yeah. Just, some studio genius said, ah, cheaper to do CGI. You know, it's funny that like uh, shows like The Walking Dead have been even finding that sometimes relying on CGI is too expensive. There have been all these like photos that have surfaced that I'm like, oh, if you just move the camera over another inch, you would see that that house was actually a photo hung in just a doorway of the front of a house that was built because they're not building the full house anymore. You know what I mean? Like it's like they're going even who sees like that in my street. You know what I mean? Like they're going (laughs) beyond practical. They're going like, fuck, we got to fake this. It's it's, it's an interesting carousel that it, it it winds up going on. But, you know, if you take two movies, like take the, the what was it, 2015, they remade Poltergeist with uh, Jared Harris. And if you mm-hmm. watch the original, I mean, even though when you watch the original and you could see how they did the practical effects and that might take you like a half a step out because you could see it, it's still so much fucking better and awesome. scarier than the new poltergeist like it, i watched it, 10 it, minutes in that whole tunnel sequence and i was like oh fuck this you know what i mean it it was such a turn off you bring up poltergeist like the when when she's running down the hallway to get the kids in that spider creature that thing, yeah you, you know shit. how they did it but it's freaking scary i mean it's you know that with the roar with everything about like it was atmospheric it was it was elemental it was environmental with also having the personal the personability of it and that was so lasting that it's a big reason why season one of stranger things is so successful you know it's like they had they had the right blend of practical where they were like okay how and i was asking them when i was on set i'm like so 
um, how are you going to zhuzh that um, creature up? Oh, they're like, oh, we got KY jelly by the buckets. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, Which goes and back he, to Alien, by the way, because yeah. that's how exactly, they always made the Alien. Exactly. Uh, and, and Alien won for best makeup and effects, I think, right? Mm-hmm. When yes, it back in the day. And so I think Stranger Things is one of those. And, and of course, this goes back. This is a show and not movie. So the better content, obviously, going to shows um, rather than movies, they, they have that balance where, okay, we couldn't possibly build this uh, on budget. <laughs> so we're going to CGI the monster in the clouds, you know. Yeah. The big so it's balanced. But, but, but we can totally, you know, make this, uh, you know, portal look all, you know, nasty and, and gooey and stuff because we've got KY Jelly. So. You can't see GI that, you know, yeah. you have the character kind of go through and they're, they come out all, you know, grimy looking. You can't see GI that. You just got to, you know, slap on some KY jelly and, and make it <laughs> happen. <you know? laughs> so just many situations made thing. better with well, KY jelly. Like the tag that was line a little too personal, though. <laughs> we yeah, went through about a bucket of it in our last short film, so. <laughs> oh, wow. So you know where to get the industrial size uh, cans, right? Like well, I love. Oh yeah, they had them. Like, oh, I <laughs> yeah. club. Yeah, that was. Uh, oh wait. Get Fuck, it. that was a conversation wow. ender. <laughs> <laughs> that was awkward. And we're done. And we're done. <laughs> so, as we're kind of shot on Hollywood, is there a way? Is there a storyline or a way they can make an original horror movie mm. yeah hire us because we have all the original ideas yes <laughs> clearly yes. Stop, stop being afraid of the bottom line and worrying that the monster you create has to fit in a happy meal box or on a uh, a 32 ounce drink cup at your local fast food place and start making it yeah yeah seriously yeah. that right there that <laughs> I mean, not everything needs a freaking merchandising tie-in. It just, yeah, it doesn't. Not everything has to be a money grab. Create something for the pure art of creating it, and people will be drawn to it, and it will make money. And then we seek out the T-shirts and the posters. I mean, you know how yeah. long it took me to find an original Dawn of the Dead movie poster when that movie came out. I mean, I was I, I was going to every theater I could find and and saying, "Hey, are you guys gonna are you gonna keep this? You're gonna keep? Oh, somebody already has it. Oh, somebody already has it." Until I can finally get one, you know. I mean, but those again, those days are gone because now kids will just go onto eBay and grab whatever they want. But yep. stop making it about the items that you can put together and start making it about a show that mm -hmm. is going to draw people in. And I think that's the that's the thing we can hope for. But you've got to realize that the executives are going to want to take that risk that it's not a quick money grab and that there's not a multi million dollar merchandising tie in to go on with it at the end. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, okay, I just watched a movie called Mother that Darren Aronofsky directed, and critics shat on it, like, universally, and people who saw it didn't quite understand it, and, you know, it's a, it's more of an artsy kind of film, and I fucking loved it. I'm like, okay, all right, that was pretty fucking cool, and then, and then I hear people bitch about it, oh, I don't understand it, you know, what was the point of it, da da da, -da. I'm like, it's what we're doing to the earth. That's the horror. And, and you know, I, I'm sorry. I liked Spoiler it. Spoiler alert, by the way. <laughs> Whitley Stryber yeah. had a great book called Greenhouse Day. Grab Whitley Stryber's Greenhouse Day and read that. They could, that's, that's plenty scary. Turn that into a horror movie because yeah. he, uh, he wrote War Day when we were on the cusp of, you know, going heads up right. with the USSR. But then he followed it up with Greenhouse Day, and Greenhouse Day was far scarier yeah. than, than War Day. And right. actually, you bring up a really good point and just go make some awesome books into awesome movies. You know, like that's the one thing we don't mind you remaking. Take a fucking incredible book. Don't blow and... for stuff. <laughs> Why? They, they, they screw that up too. Look at the Dark Tower. Yeah. Well, I said make an awesome movie. I didn't say make a shitty movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but my, my, point, my point being is they can't even do that right. Right. It's already written for you and you still can't make it right. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that Anytime. Down to picking yeah. something that can convert over to film. I mean, if you've got something that takes a lot of space up here, it's not going to play out well because you can't do a movie about what a guy is thinking. And a lot of that's what happens in a lot of those, you know, really good books is a lot of it happens upstairs, you know, mm -hmm. and it's the way that they're thinking and what's got them afraid and why they're afraid. 
and it's that's hard to convey you know there like, have a been... lot of people it's not horror and a lot of people hate this movie and for obvious reasons but david lynch's dune he tried mm-hmm. to put what people were thinking at times you would hear the voiceover yeah. of what you know, direct thoughts that were from the book say I what fu- you will about the movie i love it but i fucking love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> that, I did too. that movie is awesome and that, yeah. that's actually the movie that i was thinking of when i was saying that to me you know it's it's like you know there are some people that do find ways to translate what they're seeing and hearing in their head when they're reading a book to what makes it to the screen and those people we could trust some of those people I, I, you know, I'll argue that Dune is a fucking amazing movie, but I wouldn't mind a movie with a narrator. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, a, a really good one uh, was a French film. Um, and I don't remember the exact date. I'm going to look it up while I'm while I'm talking about it. But uh, have any of you ever seen the film Baxter? Rings a bell. Yeah. I think, so. I think I've heard of it, but I don't. I've never. I've heard, heard of the Baxter, about, but I know that's oh, not what you're talking about. It's about a it's about a dog, um, some kind of carrier, and the dog is basically a sociopath. Hmm. And what I think it did really well was, um, of course, it was a French film, but you hear a narrator talking the dog's thoughts. It was as much as I loved Cujo as a movie, it was oh. everything that Cujo the book was. Ah, hmm. uh. because in Cujo the book you get to read the dog's thoughts while he has the rabies. Now, Baxter doesn't have rabies, but, um, just, <laughs> you know, just... He's just an asshole. <laughs> the way that it, it, he talked about people with stuff like that. I mean, it was, you know, it can be done if, well, if people are willing to put the time into it. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I, I think that and that's and that's the show, folks. <laughs> well, one thing uh, that I really liked is when Final Destination, the first one, came out, and just the freak accident, like, okay, your sink is leaking and you're going to die because of it. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty original, and like how the death scenes were kind of set up to be like these weird, you know, Rube. Um, Gold Gold, yeah, the Rube, Bol- Rube Goldberg machines. Yeah. yeah, the Rube Goldberg machines of murder, <laughs> you know. Um, that that made me kind of, you know, oh, okay, this is kind of new and fresh and original. Um, when I saw Saw for the first time, I was like, whoa, okay, I've seen something. When I saw Scream for the first time, whoa, I've got, I saw something. And, you know, all of, you know, all of those that I just mentioned turned into franchises and then kind of they got watered down right along the way. And each one of those started with developing stories about the characters. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Started yeah. with the people, and that's just it. Is then once they become a franchise, it's just slaughter mm-hmm. for slaughter's sake. And that's that's where it all goes south. Because each of those is the first ones are all good. Same thing with the very first Friday or Friday the thirteenth, Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, all of them, first time out are wonderful movies to watch it's once it becomes a franchise and now that's all they're looking for is a movie to make a franchise so they just shortcut the crap out of it give you all the good you know the quote good bits and let it roll yeah yeah i agree but i would take another shitty horror franchise if for just the fact we get the first great one well i think part of it is too is you know we talk about all these things hollywood's doing and You know, they dump, you know, a lot of the most successful horror films were films that didn't have a large budget. If you go back and look at it historically, yes, you have the oddity where they put, you know, what was it, 20, 40 million dollars, whatever it is to making it. And, you know, it grossed, what, 600 million worldwide, whatever. But I think what Hollywood needs to do, if they really want to find that next franchise, if they really want to find that next great film, Instead of spending $20 million on one film, why don't you go find 20 independent up-and-coming film directors and give each one of them a million-dollar budget? Yeah. That's basically how Saw got made. I say we just revert to radio drama. (laughs) Hey, here. Well, that's yeah. where it all started, anyways. Uh, you know, <laughs> and we're you going back. Here by back to well, yeah, War of the Worlds um, was on the radio, and people thought it was real. 
They were yeah, so right? they were committing suicide. They're like, oh my god, <laughs> aliens are here. <laughs> so it's Black Friday. We're out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's only because people didn't hear the first two minutes of the show. Yeah, yeah. In, in the middle, and that that's uh, that's really what. Strategically kind of, done, man. I love Orson Welles for that shit. You know, <laughs> the crazy thing about Orson Welles is he took so much shit from the from the radio executives because of that, but he was unapologetic through the entire thing. Yeah. He knowingly yeah. caused a near riot panic. <laughs> like it was like oh, there were people yeah. didn't die as a result of that shit. Knowing yeah. what happened to it now. Knowingly, no, not at the time. He had no clue because it he went out and he's at the beginning of the broadcast. They stated that this was, uh, yeah, but they they purposely started it like a few minutes early so that yes. people wouldn't switch over from the show that they were right. all listening to the right. big they did. All listen to. So that that I think is where we say, you know, creative genius was this Andy Kaufman in an earlier iteration or was this a fucking lunatic? You know what I mean? And right. you know, is it the, the thing? I, yeah. Depends on your perspective, I guess, right? <laughs> I think we've all said what we needed to say. <laughs> We're waiting yeah. on Drew to take us out. <laughs> yeah, that's the fun bit. I just sit back and like watch people fucking going, going, like, going, when the fuck is this ending? Yeah, what is he going to have us do next? <laughs> I mean, I guess the, the last thing I have to say is if you are a creative person and you've got a story to tell, or you're a filmmaker and you you have an original story to tell, don't wait for someone to pick you. Pick your goddamn self and put it out there because people are gonna may love it. Why not pick yourself? That's what I'm going to say. I mean, I'm not going to try to push anything I make, but we just try to do stories we, we, what we think might be created, but we just do it and worry about what people think later on. And we try to do something new. We work with very little money. And it's the easiest time in history to do it. Yep. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say that it's always funny when people bring up lawsuits. Earlier, before I fucking cut out and was out half the fucking show because whatever the fuck was going on here, um, you were talking about lawsuits. And I just want to say one thing. Fuck you, pirate boy. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed your mail you got. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> Man, that... a little bit of an inside joke there. Uh, oh, I right, thank you all for coming on the show. Uh, anyone get any final words before we wrap this up? Hollandine.com. You have to get your script final down. Words, dude. not plugs. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my final words. Check out Hollandine.com. <laughs> Half the everybody on here is in an audio drama that I'm in uh, producing, so check it yeah, out. Yeah, on my tombstone will be catch me on Hollandine.com. <laughs> <laughs> Podcasting from the afterlife. <laughs> uh, I think we should just all have like all the holiday people like on our urn for the tombstone. Catch me on holiday nine, and then like we'll still have like recording set up so that way like months and maybe like a year after, and they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> we'll let them know. That, would be, scary. that <laughs> would be scary. My tombstone's going to say, "I told you, Angela Lansbury was dodgy." Oh. <laughs> That's all right. Your tombstone's going to be shaped like this. Yeah. <laughs> Murder she wrote, man. Murder oh, she wrote. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So, to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> That's all, folks. Fuck you. <laughs>